So the answer is yes. Got it. So here is the, the first uh, triumph of the uh, theory of uh, Banach algebras, of the Gelfand theory of Banach algebras. That nowadays we teach uh, with Maria, our students in the graduate uh, uh, class at the University of Athens. And uh, let us let us try and generalize this idea. You can do the same thing in any uh, locally compact group. So um, let's let's uh, try and revise this quickly. Take a locally compact group gamma and call its dual group G. And then I define A of G to be the set of all Fourier transforms of functions which are Lebesgue integral with respect to Lebesgue measure, uh, to Haar measure, I'm sorry, on gamma. And by the Riemann Lebesgue lemma, this is a subset of the continuous function that vanishes at infinity. And again, as in the case of the, of the circle, we transfer the norm from, from L1 of gamma to uh, the set A of G. So we define we define the norm of an element of A of G to be the L, L1 norm of its inverse Fourier transform. Okay, so uh, I want to express this uh, in terms that do not involve uh, the dual group gamma. Or the... Mm. Okay, so I want to get rid of gamma. So if you have function function in L1, you can you can uh, um, you can make it a product of two functions in L2 of gamma. So the, the Fourier transform is then the integral of uh, xi times eta bar with respect to the character chi of s. And this you can write as a scalar product of the function phi sub s, which is the function defined on gamma uh, that at, at the character he takes the value he of s. So multiplication of this function on xi, inner product eta, the inner product being taken in L2 of gamma. So now I have I have uh, translated uh, the the formula like so, and therefore if I take Fourier transform now, which is a unitary map from L two of gamma to L two of g, then my my Fourier transform phi bar at s, which I wrote this way, by Fourier transform can be written this way, namely multiplication by by uh, by the character uh, s becomes translation by s. And xi goes to xi, xi, the Fourier transform of xi, and eta goes to the Fourier transform of eta in the space L2 of g. So now this, this blue formula um, gives you a formula for the element uh, f hat of a of g that does not involve the dual group at all. And here I'm using, of course, the notation uh, lambda sub s is, is the left translation operator on L2 of g. So now this blue formula is a formula that makes sense makes sense uh, on the group G. It does not require the dual group gamma. And mm -hmm. therefore, uh, following AMR, I can define uh, for any locally compact group, abelian or not, the Fourier algebra uh, to be the space of all functions that are of this form. Mm -hmm. You take two vectors, C and eta in L2 of G, you translate one by S and you take the scalar product. So you take all functions of this form, and this forms the Fourier algebra. If you look at this formula, it is not clear at all that these, these functions form an algebra. It is not even clear that they form a linear space. If you have two functions like that, lambda s c eta and lambda s c, c prime eta prime, why is there some lambda s of xi double prime eta double prime? It's not obvious mm -hmm. at all, but uh, okay. So let me um, take one step back and come back to the abelian case for uh, for uh, a little while. So again, let's take a, a locally compact abelian group gamma with dual group G as before. And now I've defined B of G to be the set of Fourier transforms, not only of L1 functions, but of, of, uh, of uh, complex measures on gamma. Mm -hmm. So the Fourier transform of a measure is a continuous bounded function on G. And again, I can transfer the norm, the, the, the total variation norm of the measure, the complex uh, regular Borel measure, back to the, to the, to the uh, function algebra B of G and define the norm of the Fourier transform to be the norm of mu. <laughs> Excuse me. So again, I, want, I, want, I have the space of functions on, on, on G. And again, I want to express this without using the dual group gamma. So um, let us recall uh, Bochner's theorem, which uh, one teaches in uh, um, graduate courses of um, 
of harmonic analysis. For example, it's uh, very prominent in Katz Nelson's uh, book. If you have a continuous function that, that is of positive type, what does positive type mean? It means if you take the function u and form this matrix, this n by n matrix, by taking elements si and sj and taking fj inverse si. So this matrix needs to be positive semi-definite for all choices, for all n tuples of elements. So mm -hmm. if you have a function of positive type, then it is the Fourier transform of a positive measure. This is Bochner's theorem. Therefore, the set that I had before, the Fourier transforms of all measures, since every complex measure is a complex linear combination of positive measures, the space of Fourier transform is the complex linear span of P of G. By P of G, I mean continuous functions of positive type. So again, with this formula here, I have rephrased the definition of, G, of B of G in a way that does not involve the dual group gamma. So again, following AMR, I can define the fourier stilges algebra of any locally compact group to be the, the set of all complex linear combinations of continuous functions uh, on the group that are of positive type in the sense that are just defined, in the sense that they form positive semi-definite matrices of any size. So I have my two I two sets, and here, here let us let us try and, and uh, rephrase this definition somewhat. Uh, so you have you have a, a um, the complex linear span of functions of positive type. If you take a function of positive type, then it is not very difficult to see that each such function, using the gerfan nijmark siegel representation, defines a unitary cyclic representation of the group on some Hilbert space H. In, a, in in uh, such that the the positive type function that you have is the uh, the uh, state defined by by the representation pi at the vector c. So equivalently, using using uh, this formula and uh, what's it called polarization, the linear span of uh, all these functions u is the linear span of all these uh, representations. So it is the space of all functions that are of the form scalar product of P, pi of x acting on c in a product eta for any representation, for any unit representation of the group, I mean strongly continuous, and any two vectors in the space of the representation. So this is an equivalent definition <laughs> of the uh, Fourier. Was there a question? No. Uh, OK. Now, it is easier to see it's not a totally obvious but it's easier to see than in the case of the uh, of the Fourier algebra that this is indeed a linear space by taking direct sums of representations and in fact it is an algebra by taking tensor products of representations so it is an algebra with pointless multiplication and in fact if you equip if you equip, you equip the functions you the, with the norm that you get by taking the the infimum of all uh, products of norms of xi times eta for every representation of u as a as a as a functional like this, then you get a banach algebra norm. So um, so you have a, a definition of the Fourier stilges algebra. So now I've I've uh, expressed both my algebras in terminology that does not require a billion groups at all. And uh, the, uh, um, if you like, the basic contributions of AMR's definition uh, is uh, is to uh, show you uh, some very uh, striking properties of the Fourier algebra G, A of G. First of all, it is uh, included in the in the Fourier stilger algebra, and in fact, is a closed ideal in there with the same norm, mm -hmm. and also. If you take a, a an element of the Fourier stilges algebra that happens to have compact support, then it it gets back into the uh, into the algebra of G, and such functions are dense uh, form a dense subspace of A of G. And this gives you gives you, this gives you a very nice approximation properties. That's one one magic one magic property. The other magic property is that the Fourier algebra is the predual of the von Neumann algebra of the group. What is the von Neumann algebra of the group? You take the, the left regular representation on L2 of G, 
and take the segment commutant. So this is the, if you like, it's the commutant of the rise regular representation. And uh, uh, with this definition, A of G is precisely the set of weak star continuous linear forms on, on von Neumann G uh, defined by this duality. Or to say it more clearly, if you have a function U of S of this form, then it defines uniquely uh, a linear form on, on von Neumann G by taking an operator T to the scalar product of T, uh, T or acting on C scalar product theta. And this definition does not depend on the representation of U as, as a scalar product and uh, defines, defines a weak star continuous linear form. And all weak star continuous linear forms on von Neumann G are of this form. Uh, this was uh, initially proved by Aymar in his thesis, and it also follows uh, by um, Hagerup's MSc thesis of 1975, in which he defined, he, he yes, he gave the first uh, complete definition of um, the standard form of a von Neumann algebra, from which it follows that if you take, if you take this von Neumann algebra, the von Neumann algebra generated by left translations, then it is in standard form when it acts on B of L2 of G. Mm. And therefore, all its normal states are vector states. And therefore, all its weak star continuous linear forms are of this form. So from this remark, it follows, uh, it's one, of a, one way of seeing that, uh, that these functionals do form a linear space. Okay, and in fact, it's uh, a Banach space. Fine. So here are here are the uh, ah. I'm sorry. And and the third the third magical property that AMR proved about the Fourier algebra is the fact that since this is an this is an abelian Banach algebra with respect to pointwise um, uh, pointwise multiplication, you can try and find the spectrum, its maximal ideal space, and it turns out to be homeomorphic to the group G uh, in its in its uh, natural topology. So you have the exact analog of uh, the, the case that I mentioned, the first slide of the um, continuous functions with absolutely convergent Fourier series. And it works in any locally mm. compact uh, group at all. Okay, now, one of the basic uh, uh, properties for which these algebras are interesting is uh, the fact that they remember the group. Uh, which is uh, a theorem proved by Walter in 1970. Excuse me? Oh. Is, is there a question? No, no, not for me. Okay. Um, so, uh, so Walter proved in 1972 that if you have uh, two locally compact groups, G and H, then the fourier stilges algebras are isometrically isomorphic as Banach algebras, if and only if the groups are isomorphic as topological groups. Mm -hmm. If and only if the Fourier algebras are isometrically isomorphic as Banach algebras. So this is to say that the, the uh, A of G and also B of G both remember the group exactly as a topological group. And, and here I, I would like to mention that all these uh, all these this material and much more is contained in some very nice lecture notes by Nico Spronk, which you can find in the list of references um, mm -hmm. that I will show in the end. Okay, now let us come to homomorphisms. So a little bit of history. Uh, Cohen, the well-known forcing Cohen, in uh, 1960, was uh -huh. able to charac characterize, excuse me? No, no. Okay, so Cohen was able to characterize all homomorphisms from A of H into B of G for abelian groups, for locally or compact abelian groups. And his characterization uh, was obtained using First, a characterization of the idempotence in B of G. So functions in B of G such that U square is the same as U. I will come back to this detail, to this uh, definition in detail um, in a little while. Then uh, host in 1986 was able to extend the characterization of idempotence of Cohen to uh, uh, getting rid of abelianness. So for every locally compact group, he, he, he was able to characterize the idempotence. But he was not able to use his result in order to characterize homomorphism for general uh, locally compact groups. 
uh, and the gap, the gap uh, that uh, that uh, was necessary to fill was the notion of complete boundedness, which uh, I will uh, talk about in a minute. <laughs> so then came Monica Ely and Nico Sprong in 2005 that were able to characterize those homomorphisms from A of H into B of G, which are completely bounded, which I will explain in a second. Um, in, in the case where one of the groups, H, uh, uh, was amenable. And the, the characterization they obtained was uh, exactly the same as the one, uh, the one of Cohen's in terms of piecewise affine, piecewise affine maps, which I will also define in a little while. Let me um, tell you as, uh, as uh, simply as I can the idea of complete boundedness that is used here. Um, if you notice the definition of A of H and B of G, the dual of A of H is for Neumann H, and the dual of B of G, I didn't mention that, but it's a C-style algebra of the group. So the, both these, these objects have duals that are C-style algebras. So their duals, by, by Gelfand theory, can be considered as bounded operators on some Hilbert space. So their duals are operators. Now, if you have a linear map between, from A of H to B of G, then you call it completely bounded if it's dual map that, that is from this sister algebra to this sister algebra, if this dual map is completely bounded in the following sense, in the following sense, if you take this map phi star and tensor it with the identity and look at it as an operator from this sister algebra tensor with the complex on L2 to this sister algebra tensor with the complex of L2, then this new operator is, is a bounded operator. This is a, a formulation of uh, complete boundedness that I learned from uh, Professor Helemsky. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, of, of course, I do not need to tell you uh, what tensor product I'm using here, because the algebra of compact operators on little, little two is a nuclear sister algebra. So the, there is a unique, the unique sister norm on the tensor product. OK, so. Complete boundedness um, from for a linear map between A of H and B of G, I define it, I define it indirectly via its dual space. So I go to the dual space, uh, observe that this consists of operators on some Hilbert space. So I can tensor, I can tensor, I can take, I can take infinite matrices and calculate the norms there. And if these norms um, turn out to be bounded, then I call my phi a completely bounded map. Okay, so this is this is the uh, history, and uh, let me come to more detailed uh, uh, characterizations of these uh, things. So first of all, characterization of item importance. Um, okay, the theorem of host in 1986 states that if you have a a, um, a locally compact group G, and you take you take a function in B of G which is an item important, if it's an item important, it must be the characteristic function of some set. So a characteristic function of some set is, is in B of G, if and only if the set is in the open coset ring of G. What is the open coset ring? It is the ring generated by open cosets. What are open cosets? They are translates of open subgroups. So therefore, the elements of uh, the open coset rings are open and closed. Okay. In other words, the set of functions in B of G, which are equal to their square, is equal to the set of functions of the form chi sub f, where f is an element of the open coset ring. OK, so that's that's host theorem. Uh, to come to homomorphisms, let us first make a, a, a fairly simple observation. Consider a, a map from A of H to B of G. H and G are locally compact groups, which is a bounded homomorphism. And do the following thing. Fix an element S in the group G and consider the map from A of H to the complex numbers that takes a function U, takes a row of it, and evaluates at a point S. Mm. Okay, This is a composite of two multiplicative functions. Okay, Row is multiplicative. Evaluation is multiplicative. So this map rho sub S, this functional rho sub S, is multiplicative. However, it's not necessarily a character because it could be zero. So take the set of all S's for which this map is not zero. So it's a character. So if you take an S in Y, then rho S is a character. 
And therefore, since it's a character of A of H, you know that the set of characters of A of H are the points of H. Therefore, given this S, there is an element alpha S in H such that rho of U evaluated at S is the same as U evaluated at alpha sub S. This is just using the fact <laughs> that the character space of AH is H. So now we have constructed a map defined on Y on the set of S is for which rho S does not vanish, taking values in H, a map alpha, such that my, my uh, original homomorphism the rho is of the form rho of u is u circle alpha when you are in y and zero otherwise. So I can write this as a shorthand characteristic function of y, u circle alpha. So now I have, I have a simple formula for a bounded homomorphism from between these uh, between these elements between these spaces, and the point, of course, is to determine what sort of maps alpha arise uh, from bounded homomorphisms um, between these two spaces. So from now from now on, our our effort is to understand exactly uh, what what the structure of alpha is, and uh, this again is due uh, to to Cohen in the abelian case and was generalized as I mentioned uh, before, by Elie and uh, Sprong uh, for the locally compact case. Okay, two steps. First, take, you have the, your two groups, take a subgroup of G and uh, translate it, excuse me, <clears throat> translate it to get a coset C. Then if you have a map alpha defined on this coset with values in the other group, this is called affine if it is a translate of a homomorphism, of in fact, of a continuous homomorphism. I want to put continuity into the definition. In other words, if my mapping alpha is affine, if it, it, uh, it is obtained as follows, you translate to go uh, into your, uh, your uh, subgroup. Then you take your homomorphism theta. This is, a, this is a homomorphism defined on the subgroup that takes you to H, and then you translate again. So it's a, a map is affine if it is of this form of this form here. And as I say, I put continuity into the definition, which uh, some authors do not. Okay, second step. A map defined on some subset Y of G is called piecewise affine if the, the, the set of definition of alpha splits in, this, in a finite disjoint union of elements Yi that are uh, that do belong to the open coset ring, and alpha. If you restrict it to each of these alpha of these yi's, uh, this mapping alpha restricted to yi extends to an affine map uh, from a coset ci, which is open and contains yi. So this this uh, complicated definition is the is the idea of a piecewise affine map, and as I say, continuity is is built into the definition. Okay, and with these with these elements, I can now state um, I can now state Cohen's theorem. So you take uh, you you are given a piecewise affine map defined in a, in a, an element of the open coset ring as before, and then you define your uh, uh, mapping rho from a of h to b of g as follows: rho of u. If you take a function u in a of h, rho of u at a point t will be u circle alpha at t if t belongs to y and zero otherwise. It's the same formula that I wrote before using the characteristic function of y. And the theorem of Cohen of 1960 is that in the case that the groups are abelian, uh, the mapping row that you've defined does indeed map into b of g and is a bounded homomorphism. This is the easy part. And the crucial part is that if you have any bounded homomorphism from A of H to B of G, then you can find uh, a piecewise affine mapping alpha such that the row is given by this formula. Okay, this is the uh, famous theorem of Cohen. Uh, and uh, this was generalized uh, by, uh, by Monica Ely and Nikos Pronk in, in 2005 for general locally compact groups. And the theorem is that the same formula does define a homomorphism, and it is not only bounded, it's completely bounded. 
in the sense that I mentioned before, in the sense of this uh, matrix uh, uh, boundedness. And moreover, if the mapping, if the space H is amenable, then every completely bounded map from A of H to B of G must be of this form. Mm. So it generalizes Cohen's theorem for completely bounded maps and when one of the groups is amenable. Amenable means uh, uh, the, the shortest definition that I can give here, and is, which is also of a functional analytic uh, flavor, is that uh, I call a group amenable if there is a functional defined on, on L infinity of H, which is a positive linear functional that takes uh, um, the value one at the ident as in, in and is invariant under left translations. So left, it's a left invariant mean. Okay, so that's that's the theorem of Ilya and Sprong, and it is um, possibly best possible, uh, possibly best, well, mm -hmm. in, in the sense that I will tell you now, that if uh, the group H not only is not amenable, but contains the free group in, in two generators, then they, they define an example of a, of a completely bounded map from A of H to B of G, which is not of this form. So the theorem fails uh, if uh, the, the uh, group H contains F2. Uh, the reason why it's not best possible is that there are now known uh, non-amenable groups that do not contain the free group in, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, two generators. But anyway, uh, under, this, under this restriction, it is best possible. Fine. So now, now I can start uh, to uh, describe uh, our results. Okay, so let me first of all uh, um, uh, come back to the to the simple case of the of the integer group and try to give you an example. Okay, you take f to be the integer from minus k to k, k fixed, and uh, if you have a, an element, a function u in in a of z in the Fourier algebra of z mm -hmm. of the integers, then you define u sub phi to be at j to be u of zero if j belongs to the to this interval and zero otherwise. Okay, and using this uh, this idea, you can define a map rho sub phi from the Fourier algebra of z to the Fourier algebra of z that takes u to u sub phi. And uh, this map is not very difficult to uh, verify that it is a well defined uh, bounded homomorphism. In fact, in fact, it is of the form that I had before, but never mind this. So let me try, given given this uh, uh, given this uh, formula, let me try and calculate the norm of this uh, homomorphism uh, rho sub phi. Okay, take consider the function from the integer to itself, which at the point i is one if i is zero and zero otherwise. Then it's easy to see that this function does belong to the Fourier algebra of Z. And its norm in the Fourier algebra is exactly one. Hmm. If you if you take if you take rho sub phi of this function, then it is exactly the characteristic function of the of the uh, set f, the interval from minus k to k. And let's try to for, to to find the norm of this element in the Fourier algebra. The norm of this element in the Fourier algebra, by definition, is the L one norm of its Fourier transform. So, what is the Fourier transform of the characteristic function? of the set of minus k to k, it is exactly the, the Dirichlet kernel. It is exactly the sum of the trigonometric functionals from minus k to k. So therefore, the norm of the, uh, of the uh, mapping rho sub phi, which of course is uh, at least uh, the, the value of the norm of this functional at u0, since the u0 has norm one, is exactly the norm of the characteristic function of f uh, in the Fourier algebra of Z, which is the same as I mentioned before, as the Fourier transform of the norm of the Fourier transform in L1 of the circle of the dual group. What is this norm? It's exactly the L1 norm of the Dirichlet kernel. And of course, we teach our students that uh, the Dirichlet kernel is a bad kernel because its norm grows like log k. So <laughs> I have uh, given you a simple construction. Uh, on the, on the integers, on, on the on the Fourier algebra of the integers, of a of a bounded homomorphism rho sub f, whose norm is as large as you like. Okay, so the conclusion is the following: 
the fact that there exists idempotence in A of Z of large norm, that this is what we used. We found that the idempotent chi sub F has large norm. This gave us the existence of homomorphisms from A of Z with A of Z of large norm. So given this example, the questions that we want to address are the following two. First of all, for which locally compact groups can I find idempotence in B of G, which are as, as large in norm as I like? And secondly, if I can find such large importance, uh, do I also find uh, large uh, uh, homomorphism between the Fourier algebras of this group and uh, other groups? So these mm -hmm. are the two questions that I want to answer in the rest of my time. Okay. So first, norms of wide importance. Our first result is the following: if you take if you take the case of a discrete group but infinite then uh, I can find the importance in B of G that are uh, of as large norm as I like. Uh, notice that here, uh, if I'm in a discrete group, uh, any finite set will give me a characteristic function that is in the Fourier steel charge, but in fact, in the Fourier algebra. So I, not only can I do this, I can do this with A of G rather than B of G here. To move uh, from uh, discrete groups to more uh, more uh, uh, complicated ones, uh, we use a, a, a result of Leiderman, Morris, and Kachenko, which is of 2019, rather recent result, uh, topological result, which is uh, uh, is uh, uh, uses totally totally disconnected groups. So now, if I move from infinite discrete groups to infinite totally disconnected groups, then again, then again, I can find either importance B of G of arbitrarily large norm. Okay, this this follows uh, from from uh, our discrete result using uh, using uh, the construction of uh, Leidman, Morris, Kachenko, and some and some uh, rather intricate um, um, functional analytic uh, ideas. Okay, for the next result, I need uh, I need to quote a uh, uh, couple of more tools. First of all, Amar proved in, 1970, uh, in 1964, in the original paper on the Fourier algebra, uh, the following, that if you have a locally compact group and a closed normal subgroup, and you take uh, Q to be the quotient map, then the mapping that takes U to U composed with Q is a map from the Fourier steel algebra of the, of the quotient to the Fourier steel algebra of the numerator. And in fact, this map is isometric. And moreover, if the denominator is compact, excuse me, then the same map takes the Fourier algebra of the quotient to the Fourier algebra of G. Mm. So this is this is the result of AMR that you have an isometry here, linear isometry. And the other tool that we need is the following proposition. And if you take a locally compact group and you let now G, G sub EP the connected component of its identity, then if you look at the coset ring, the open coset ring of G and the open coset ring of the quotient group, then these two rings are isomorphic rings, Boolean algebras. These two rings are isomorphic as, as Boolean algebras. And the isomorphism is given by the fact that you take, you take an open coset here and you, take, uh, you, uh, and you map it to an open quotient here by taking the quotient map. This mapping is an isomorphism of uh, Boolean algebras. And so you can observe already that if this, uh, this uh, quotient of G mod its uh, component com com connected component of the identity, if this quotient is finite, then the open quotient ring is finite. And therefore, by hosts, uh, and therefore, and therefore the, the number of item potents. Uh, in B of G is, is finite. And therefore, you cannot find uh, item points of infinitely large norm. So if the quotient of G by its connected component of the identity is finite, for example, if the group is connected, then you have no hope of finding item points of large norm. But what happens if this, uh, if this quotient is infinite? So here comes our next theorem. Uh, if the quotient of G by G uh, by G is infinite, then in B of G, I can find the importance of as large norm as I like. And the proof uses 
our previous result about uh, totally disconnected groups. Okay, so if you take this, to, if you take this to be finite, I, I explained before that the supremum cannot be infinite. If this, if you take this quotient to be infinite, then this quotient is a totally disconnected group because I've divided out by the connected component of the identity. And therefore, by our previous result about totally disconnected groups, I can find in the quotient group, in the Fourier steel result of the quotient group, I had importance of, of as large norm as I like. Now, using the fact of AMR that the application that uh, the application of the quotient group to G is an isometry, I can lift up this result to uh, finding um uh, at importance of arbitrarily large norm in B of G itself. And that, that concludes the proof of this result. Fine. Now let's go back. Let's uh, uh, let's uh, turn our attention to the Fourier algebra rather than the Fourier steel algebra. And here we have the following. Uh, again, you take uh, the connected component of the identity and the followings are equivalent. The quotient is infinite and the connect component of the identity is small, if mm -hmm. and only if you can find in A of G this time, um, item pods of arbitrarily large norm. Mm -hmm. So this is this is a characterization of when you when you can find an points of large norm in the Fourier algebra. Okay, now let's move let's move from item pods having these results about item pods. We know exactly we have an exact characterization of when we can find um item much of large norm in a of g and b of g and this um relies on the on the uh, number of elements in g mod g let's turn to homomorphisms okay you have your groups uh, g and h and you take uh, an, an open corset i'm sorry not an open corset an element of the open corset ring in g then as before you define the following map for for u in a of h you define rho sub f of u at the element t to be u of e if t is in f and zero if t is not in f. This mimics exactly the example that I gave for the case when g was z and f was the, the interval from minus k to k. It mimics exactly this, but this time I take a general element of the open corset ring. Okay, uh, in this case, this mapping that I've defined uh, in this way is in fact a bound homomorphism from the Fourier algebra of H to the Fourier steel algebra of G, and its norm is exactly the norm of uh, mm -hmm. the characteristic function of the idempotent uh, uh, sub f. <laughs> so if I can find large idempotent here, I can find large homomorphism from any A of H to B of G. And the proof is, is easy. Uh, if you, uh, first of all, uh, it is easy to see that you can find an element in the Fourier algebra of H, which at the identity is equal to one, and its norm in the Fourier algebra is exactly one again. So in this case, the norm of uh, rho sub f is, uh, is at least as large as the norm of uh, rho sub f at u in the Fourier steel algebra. By definition, this is uh, u at the identity times the characteristic function of E. u at the identity, I've, I've taken it to be one. So the norm of rho sub f is at least as as uh, as big as uh, as uh, as the characteristic function of f, and the converse uh, follows um, follows by the definition of the norm of a functional. There's nothing to it. And in fact, in fact, uh, uh, I will use this in, in a moment. Uh, you're not talking to me, I presume. I'm sorry. No, okay. So uh, this this uh, mapping that I've constructed here is not only bounded, in fact, it's completely bounded, but we don't need to get into this discussion here. So using this now, uh, I can uh, I can summarize my results by giving you by giving you a characterization of the norms of homomorphisms um, of uh, locally compact groups. So take a general locally compact group and let G sub B be the connected component of the identity. Then the following are equivalent. First of all. The quotient group is infinite. If and only if I can find uh, either points of arbitrarily large norm in the Fourier steel algebra. If and only if I can find bounded homomorphisms, in fact, completely bounded homomorphisms of arbitrarily large norm from A of H into B of G for any locally compact group H. 
provided that that in here g mod g is infinite if and only if i can find a single amenable locally compact group such that for this uh, for this specific group the supreme of all cb homomorphisms uh, is again plus infinity this essentially is just a combination of the previous results together together with non characterizations uh, that i mentioned earlier of uh, Ely and Spronk about when you have a completely bound homomorphisms. So this this is is uh, our main characterization, but um, in fact uh, um, the proofs that we gave uh, are not are not uh, very constructive. They're, they're in fact very existential, and I would like to give you a, a sketch of a hmm. more restrictive result, but a more direct proof. So. Uh, so let's let's take it step by step. So first of all, start with a compact group and take uh, an item point in B or G. Then it is known that the norm of this of this item point is exactly one, because it's an item point and the norm is at least one. But it's exactly one if and only if F is a coset is a single coset of an open subgroup. It's not not a general element of the open coset ring, but a coset, just a translate of a subgroup. And this result is again by Ely and Spronk in, in 2005. Now, the interesting thing is that there's a gap. Uh, mm -hmm. Stan and Forrest and Runde proved in 2009-2011 that if the norm, the B of G norm of this uh, chi sub F is less than two over root three, then it is one because it is a coset of an open subgroup. So there's a gap. Mm -hmm. Either the norm is one or else it is greater than two over root three. In fact, two over root three is not best possible, but it is good enough for our purposes. Okay, so now you can do the following. Start with a finite group uh, with at least three elements. Take a subset of the group, which is not a coset. It's not a coset. For example, take a number of elements that does not divide the order of the group. Okay, because it's a finite group, all subsets belong to the open coset ring. And therefore, by this result, since, since A is in the open coset ring, but is not a coset, the norm is not one, and therefore it is at least two over root three, which is strictly mm -hmm. greater than one. Okay, so now start iterating. Take a number of groups, finite groups, with uh, three elements each, take their direct product, and for each of them, choose an element uh, for which the norm is at least two over root three. And now define A to be the Cartesian product of all these. Then, then uh, because, because you know that the, that the, uh, the Fourier Stilgel algebra of the Cartesian product is the operator projective tensor product of the elements, the norm of the characteristic function of A in B of G is at least the product of the norms in each of these. So it's at least two over root three to the end. And this is a large number, as large as you like. So now let's try and put all these things inside one group. So take the infinite number, the infinite product of finite groups GI, take them all to be to have uh, at least three elements. You can lump them together to achieve this. And now take the tail. For, e for every n, let hn be the tail. And look at the quotient map. Okay. Observe that this uh, that the quotient group is, of course, isomorphic to the to the product of the first ones. And therefore, by by what I mentioned in the previous slide. You can find an element in the quotient group whose norm in, in the Fourier Stilgel algebra of the quotient is at least two over root three to the n. And now <laughs> use the lift. <laughs> and now use the lifting theorem of AMR to lift to lift uh, this uh, A to the group <laughs> itself by taking by taking the quotient uh, the quotient map. And then because this map is isometric. The, the norm in B of G this time of this new element is uh, at least, this should be greater than or equal. This should be greater than or equal. Uh, this is a type I will connect or it. 
uh, of uh, two over root three to the n. So conclusion, if I have a compact group, which is uh, 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 accountably infinite product of finite groups, then in there I can construct um, item potence of arbitrarily large norm. <laughs> Um, okay, and and this is and this is the final result. And this is all I had to say. Here is a <coughs> list of references that I have mentioned, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, thank we you. thank our speaker for a very mathematically impressive, and at the same time very elegantly represent the talk. So what about questions? Um, yes, Anar, Anar, Timur, so um, what, do you, what do you have to ask? Uh, well, I guess I'll go first. So first of all, again, I would like to second uh, um, uh, Professor Hilemsky's uh, words and uh, thank you for this extremely nice and extremely clear and um, informative talk thank and I have I have two questions so one is very brief could you show again the reference to Nico Spronk's uh, survey uh, okay yeah. um, in, in fact it's, it's clickable so you can, well, you can it's, find it's it's can can you maybe post it on on in the chat for some reason? Ah, yes, yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, how, how do I do this? Uh, I'll try. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, another question is that uh, on um, yeah maybe yeah I think oh, it's gone, I, see, I, see. I think it's gone to the chat. It's in the chat. Can you see it? Uh, yes, second. Yes, yes, it's there. Okay, Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, and uh, beyond this, uh, could you maybe go back to slide number 14? Yeah, uh, like further down. Uh, fur further down. Uh, yes, so uh, uh, do I understand correctly that if the group H if the groups H and G are abelian, then uh, uh, the complete boundedness, boundedness is automatic because the corresponding uh, sister algebras uh, will be commutative. Yes. Uh, are there any other situations when the complete boundedness will arise automatically? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's a good question. I don't know. Can, Thank you. Can anybody help from the co-authors? <laughs> so this is something to think about. Very good. No other questions? I'm sorry. Uh -huh. I had, yeah, I had a simple question. So in your in the, in the early beginning of your definition, you started with the representation pi. Um, am I right that it, your construction does not depend on pi, right? Eventually, so. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Which which pi? Pi pi representation of the group pi. Oh. So, but it, it eventually does not depend on pi. Am I right? So, uh, no, it does. You, you mean the definition of b of g? Yes, yes, definition of b of g. So you have to fix the pi forever, right? Yes, for for every pi, and every x and eta, you have a function u. So it, it does depend very strongly on p. Oh yes, u every u depends on pi, right? Pi. Yes. So pi is all pi is also running, is it? Am I right? Yes. Or... Yes. yes, I, yes I okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. I got it. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Mar other questions? Martin uh, has a question. Yes, of course. Other questions? Thank you very much. Um, oh. I was just wondering, is there a, a, a relationship between um, the Fourier steel Stilkes algebra or the Fourier algebra and then the group C star algebra um, of the locally compact group? Yes, I, I didn't mention it, but the dual the dual of the Fourier steel algebra is the C star algebra of the group. Ah, oh, 
interesting. Thank you very yes. much. Yes. Mm. And 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 the the dual of the Fourier algebra is is the left von Neumann algebra of the group. Oh, that's mm. interesting. That is really interesting. Uh, th this, uh, this, in fact, is in Pedersen's book. It was known. It was uh, known for a long time that uh, that <laughs> that this construction, this construction, gives you all representations. You see, if you take a function of positive type, you can you can you you get the representation of the group. Mm. And if you have a representation of the group, it takes it gives you a function of positive type. So you have a bijection between between uh, these functions of the of the form U. And and uh, representations, uh, cyclic representations, and and this gives you the star algebra of the group. Ah, oh, thank you, thank you so much. Okay, great. Okay, other sorry, questions. I missed, sorry, I missed you in Athens, by the way. Other questions, comments, maybe counter examples or something. No, <laughs> no counterexamples. So on this optimistic view, we can again uh, thank our speaker. It was indeed a pleasure to hear you. And our next speaker after a week must be um, Vladimir Markovich Manulov. Yes, always he has interesting things. So I invite everybody and other people to join us after a week. So you, Timur, <laughs> you appeared. In. So we meet, we shall meet again after, after a week. Thanks for, for all people present, especially our speaker, and to meet you in, in a proper time after a week. So, bye-bye.